Hey everybody, it's Nate from Explorers Life, and today I'm going to be teaching you about all of the different components that are necessary to assemble a DIY camper solar setup. First things first, I have a list of links in the video's description that you're going to find very handy. This particular video is going to be a very basic parts identification type of video where we're gonna go over in a 101 level fashion what all the individual solar components are, where I'm gonna spend no more than two minutes on any one component. For some of the components, you're really gonna need some more clarification for the topics like how do I size my solar controller for my solar panels? Or how do I size the wires in my solar setup? These are gonna get their own videos and related blog posts to dive deeper into the more detailed tutorial on that particular component. So, let's get going. Solar panels are the most obvious component in a solar system. Their job is to gather solar energy from the sun, send it down the wires to the solar controller. There are two main types of solar panels. They are monocrystalline and polycrystalline. The main difference between the two is their efficiency. Take these two solar panels from the same company, for example. The one on top is a polycrystalline and the one on the bottom is a monocrystalline. The polycrystalline is rated at 160 watts and has dimensions of 58 by 26. The monocrystalline is rated at 175 watts and has dimensions of 57 by 26. So, the two are within about an inch of each other in physical size, but the monocrystalline panel is capable of producing 15 more watts per panel, which means that you could potentially be gaining an extra five to 10 amps per day per panel if you opt for monocrystalline over polycrystalline. Another thing, I've seen articles and videos talking about how these two technologies of panel function in terms of shading or cloudy days. Now, there have been a lot of opinions given on this, and I've yet to see anything like really, really conclusive one way or the other, which leads me to believe that perhaps neither one does a very good job in the shade, and perhaps you need sunlight for solar panels to work. My recommendation, since roof space on camper vans is incredibly limited, go with the monocrystalline solar panels. You'll get more power out of the same space, leaving more room for vent fans and rooftop dance parties. The polycrystalline will also be fine if you're really trying to pinch pennies, but Maybe the solar panel isn't the place to skimp as it's going to likely be one of the more difficult components to replace on down the road. Do it right, do it once. The charge controller takes the solar power from the solar panels and then converts it into a form of more organized and useful power. The power is coming from the solar panels at varying voltages, anywhere from 16 volts to potentially in the hundreds of volts depending on the setup. The charge controller regulates that voltage down to the 12 to 15 volt ballpark if you're on a 12 volt battery bank to properly charge said battery bank. Now there are two main types of charge controllers on the market, MPPT and PWM. Those stand for maximum power point tracking and pulse width modulation. Let's just stick with MPPT and PWM. PWM is an older technology. Your solar panels must be within a fairly narrow set of parameters to even be compatible with a PWM controller. They're less efficient as they are pretty much just a regulator, I guess. The only pro to a PWM controller is that they're less expensive. MPPT controllers are a newer, much more sophisticated technology and have much more processing power behind them, which lets them do more calculations depending on the input voltage to optimize the output voltage to the maximum amount of amps possible to be stored in the batteries for use. Basically, comparing an MPPT controller to a PWM controller is like comparing Netflix to Blockbuster. The buy-in fee is a little higher, but the satisfaction of being able to pick out a movie while not wearing pants just can't be beat. The buy-in is a little higher, but the added flexibility and performance will give you more bang for your buck in the long run. My recommendation? Get the MPPT controller. Unless you're strapped for cash, then save up and then get the MPPT controller. There's a lot more to say about how to size your charge controller, but it's not going to fit into this two minute spiel. So check the description to learn how to properly size your charge controller. Batteries are simply storage tanks for power. They store the power that the solar panels and the charge controller have made until it's ready to be used to run computers, charge phones, brew coffee, whatever. There are three main types of batteries on the market, lead acid, AGM, and lithium. These require maintenance and they vent corrosive hydrogen gas. They were the standard for a while, but then technology caught up. Although they can work in some setups, in my opinion, they're generally more hassle than they're worth. One star. Absorbent glass matte batteries. Actually, let's talk about lithium at the same time. AGM and lithium are the two more commonly used types of batteries and campers currently. Lithium batteries are significantly more expensive upfront, but they're cheaper over the long run. We've already explained this in a prior video in much more detail, along with many of the pros and cons of the two batteries. That video can be found in the description. My recommendation, go with lithium. It's lighter, it's more powerful, you get bigger bang for your buck in the long run. 
I get it, you can't afford lithium and you need to get on the road like yesterday and you just need a working electronic system, sure, go with AGM, but, but, get the size of AGM battery that you can switch out to lithium in the future if you happen to change your mind. So to clarify, a Battleborn battery is about 12 and 3 quarter by 7 by 9 inches. This Renogy AGM battery is 13 by 7 by 9 inches. So, if you're living for the moment and you need to go with the AGM batteries now, you can buy, say, three of the AGM batteries, and then once they wear out and you need more capacity, you can swap in three lithium batteries directly in their place, bolt them up, change a few parameters on your charge controller, and be good to go. Which would effectively triple your capacity with the exact same battery footprint. So plan for the upgrade now, and it'll make the upgrade less expensive and easier when it's time. Now I really like inverter charger combo units. It's pretty much just that, an inverter and a charger all wrapped up into one box. Your battery stores power at 12 volts. If you have something, say a coffee maker or an instant pot, you'll need 110 volts, AKA normal household plug. The inverter takes the 12 volt power stored in the batteries and converts it into 110 volt power so that you can power those household appliances. Inverters come in a few different types. There's square wave, there's modified sine wave, and there's pure sine wave. We aren't going to talk about the first two. Essentially, the power they make isn't a clean power and can damage certain electronics. I don't recommend those because I don't like recommending products that have an inherent risk of damaging other equipment. You're gonna be looking for a pure sine wave inverter. This inverter actually does the best job of mimicking the power that is actually coming through the standard plug that you can find in any on the grid wall. These pure sine inverters come in sizes from small, portable, 300 watt models all the way up to but to get by with modest usage, like running a coffee pot, an instant pot, or an induction stove, the most common size that I've seen and the size that we have in our camper van is a 2000 watt inverter. But if you wanna learn in more detail how to accurately size an inverter for your setup, you'll be looking for the link that you can conveniently find in the description as it's time to move on to the, this is how you can charge the batteries via shore power which is a campground power pedestal or even simply a plug-in at somebody's house. Yeah, shore power is basically just an external plug-in somewhere on the grid. There's not too much to say about these. You can get these in a totally separate unit, sometimes called a converter, but typically it's easier and it's cheaper to just get the all-in-one inverter charger combo package. They charge your batteries at a rapid rate, anywhere from 40 to 70 amps. My recommendation for anybody looking for the comforts of home, an inverter is a must. If your rig is just for random weekend outings, perhaps run a 12 volt refrigerator and charge cameras, drones and such, maybe you can go without. You just really have to ask yourself, what do I plan on powering and how much like home do I want this to feel? This is the device that lets you charge your solar battery bank with the engine alternator. It lets power pass when the engine is running and it closes when the engine is off so that you don't drain your starting battery as you use your solar batteries. That's basically how it works. A battery to battery charger would be lumped into the same category as well. But there's a few other considerations that need to be talked about in more depth than I want to go into in this video. So be sure to check out the link in the description for more info on that one. That's actually all the major components in a camper solar setup. But we have a lot more very small items that you'll need to complete the build. Wires, lugs, fuses, switches, breakers, and bus bars, just to name a few. These will go by pretty quickly and we won't spend more than about a minute on each one. Rather than continuing to tell you to check the description for more details, I'm actually gonna make a little uh, pop-up to let you know if more detail is available, since this is more of a what are these parts and point me in the right direction kind of video. The bus bar is an extension of your battery terminals. When we've got a dozen different wires and components that need to be connected to the battery directly, the top of the battery terminal can turn into a giant bird's nest of wires in a hurry. These just give you a little bit more room to work with your wiring and make it easier to see exactly what you've got going on and what wires are going where. The battery monitor tells you the status of your batteries, like their capacity, their voltage, and how much power is actively being generated or lost. The monitor is able to tell us this information by the information provided by the... If the battery monitor is the brain, the shunt is the body. The shunt is physically responsible of counting the amps that are either coming or going in either direction and reporting that to the battery monitor. The shunt sits in line of the negative battery terminal and the bus bar. All loads should be on the side of the shunt that is away from the battery. This is how you're going to run all of your wires to your different accessories like lights, fans, 12 volt outlets, 12 volt refrigerators, USB ports, whatever uses 12 volt power. 
The fuse block is the easiest way to make fuse connections to these low amperage devices and keep everything safe, tidy, organized, and safe. So now I guess we should talk about Fuses are what protect your wires in case of an overcurrent situation, aka a malfunction. If there are too many amps flowing through too small of a wire or something is malfunctioning, the wire can melt and possibly start a fire. Quick note, fuses and breakers are kind of sort of the same thing. If a fuse blows, you can't reuse it. If a breaker trips, you can just reset it. And I kind of use those two terms interchangeably depending on the situation. Don't let it confuse you since they kind of do the same thing. So the fuse is designed to blow or trip at a current lower than the melting point of the wire, which will cut the flow of power, effectively shutting off the hazard. There are three types of DC fuses that I find myself using. Spade fuses, resettable breakers, and ANL fuses. The type and size of fuse that I pick varies depending on how it's being used, the current going through the wire, as well as the size of the wire it's attached to. Wires keep all of your solar components tethered together so that they don't float away. Wires transport power from one component to the next. The wires come in various sizes. Small wire for use on lights and fans would be somewhere in the 12 to 18 gauge realm. Now gauge is the measurement unit for wires. There's a more technical way to explain it, but we don't need to. It's just like inches or centimeters or miles or whatever. It's a fairly relative term. Just know that a 12 to 18 gauge wire is pretty small. Oh, and the higher the number goes, the smaller the wire is. But once you get into big wire for carrying big currents like required by the inverter, it gets tricky. Because as the wire gets bigger, the gauges go from eight to six to two to zero to one aught, two aught, three aught, four aught. Sizing wires for different solar setups is honestly a pain in the ass. Ask me any questions you've got so far in the comments below. That's a bit of a side note, but you know, in case you forgot there was a comment section. Wire lugs are the ends of the wires. They let you make nice clean connections to the bus bars or distribution blocks and they're sized according to two measurements. They will have a gauge, which is the size of wire that the lug will fit onto. And it also has a stud size diameter, like quarter inch or three eighths or number eight. Uh, which is the size of the bolt that the lug is designed to fit around. Depending on the inverter charger you get, it may or may not have come with an AC breaker installed. If not, and you're wanting to hardwire 110 volt plugs throughout your camper, you're going to need to add an AC breaker. Note, I'm referencing AC power, AKA alternating current power, not AC as an air compressor. We're talking your normal household plugs here. You will need the breaker box as well as a breaker to protect the wiring of your 110 volt circuits. 110 volt plug and box. There's not much more to say about this. It's the normal standard household 110 volt plug and the box that you're going to install it into. You can add an exterior power port into your camper so that you can plug in directly into the side of the van. It looks a little less sketchy than just slamming the extension cord between the door and the door jam. I'd recommend a 30 amp plug if you're going to be planning on running an air conditioner at any point in time, or if you just never want to have to question anything regarding shore power capacity. These break the power going to lights, fans, outlets, or whatever you're trying to control. If you get a really big switch, you can kill power to the entire system right after the batteries, which is a nice feature to have. This is where you can plug in USB adapters, computer chargers, or LED 12 volt Christmas lights for some sweet hashtag van life Instagram pictures. But something to consider. On Amazon, a lot of these outlets may come with a USB plug pre-installed, and I don't like that. USB technology changes every single year. There is always some new USB technology that's going to make it faster to charge our devices. My recommendation, don't install hardwired USB outlets. Install 12 volt outlets that have flush mount USB adapters on hand. This is infinitely more versatile if you're trying to future proof your build. Now that pretty much sums up all of the parts involved in a really well built solar setup for a camper. Sure, there's more technical parts that you can add and then there's some parts that we talked about that could be omitted. But if you know what these parts are and what they do, you're well on your way to being able to design a high-end camper van solar setup. Now that we're finishing up, it'd be a great time to hit up that video description that I've been talking about and start on your next camper solar lesson. Alternatively, I recommend clicking down here to check out the blog post for a recap of this video and more information. Or if you just wanna jump right into the next video, you can click right up here. Leave me a comment if you have any questions or you just wanna say hi. <laughs> I'll see you next time.